What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of today's discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet or living on a rock and seen this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video today. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get into another very interesting organized crime topic, and we all know the story. December 16th, 1985, Gambino boss Paul Castellano would be assassinated in front of Spark Steakhouse. We know that night, not only was Paul Castellano shot, but his driver was shot as well, a man called Tommy Bellotti. Now, over the years in mob lore, not a lot's known about Tommy Bellotti. And he's essentially disregarded as a driver. Truth of the matter is, though, that like most people in the mafia, Tommy Bellotti had a very interesting life, a very interesting start, and an even bigger finish. Tommy Bellotti was not just a coffee boy or driver. He was a very underrated member of the crime family. Let's get into it. Tommy Bellotti on sit-down shorts. Thomas Bellotti was born on March 23rd, 1940 in the New York borough of Staten Island. Now, one thing about Staten Island that we know is a lot of the time, mobsters don't come up in Staten Island. Generally, they move there, whether it's from Queens or from Brooklyn or from another borough. Staten Island is a place where you don't come across a lot of people that grew up there. Now, a couple that we know that come to mind are people like Joe Watts, Stephen Caracapa, who is not a mobster, but a cop turned killer for the mob. He was from Staten Island. There were plenty of guys that came up on Staten Island, and I'm sure some of you guys will list them in the comment section below. But Tommy Bellotti was raised on Staten Island. He would live in the area of South Beach on the eastern side, not far from Grassmere, Concord, that area. And as we know, South Beach, if you look at this map, is very close to Tot Hill, which we'll talk about here a little bit. But most of the mob in Staten Island is on that eastern side, uh, basically uh, bordering uh, bodies of water. Now, for Tommy Bellotti, his family had no connection to the mafia. His father uh, was from the Rome area, and his mother was from Lombardy near Milan. And they would emigrate, and then Tommy was born. Tommy Bellotti had two brothers, one of which would follow him into the life of the mafia. Now, the early part of Tom Bellotti's life is pretty unknown, which for a lot of gangsters, we don't know a ton about their childhood or even their schooling. I couldn't find much in the way of any sort of schooling. It's probably clear that Tommy Bellotti went to high school. I would guess he probably went to New Dorp. I'm not really sure, though. It's not really important. However, Tommy Bellotti became very entrenched in connections with very powerful people in the Gambino crime family on Staten Island in the late 50s. It was alleged that Tommy Bellotti's early connection to the mafia was through multiple people, all of the same family inside the Gambino family. Tommy Bellotti would first start out as an errand boy and driver for a old school gangster called Alex DeBrizzi, a.k.a. The Ox. Now, Alex DeBrizzi was born in 1892 and goes back to the 20s in the mafia. He was very close with people like Albert Anastasia, a.k.a. The Lord High Executioner. And it was possible that we learned that Alex DeBrizzi was a big shot on the Staten Island waterfront for the Gambino crime family. As I said, the Gambino crime family was formidable and has always been formidable on Staten Island. And they had men out there that really for years ran the family's interests on the island. Now, back then, for Alex DeBrizzi in the 30s and 40s, it was the uh, Mangano crime family. But I call it the Gambino family because that's what it's most well known as. Now, DeBrizzi would have multiple nephews as well that would be in the mafia. DeBrizzi's sister married into a family called the D'Alessios. She would have multiple sons. The highest ranking son was John D'Alessio. Now, John, alongside his two brothers, basically took the mantle from their uncle, Alex DeBrizzi, and ran Staten Island. DeBrizzi was very popular on the waterfront, but D'Alessio, uh, 
and his brothers were huge in everyday rackets, bookmaking, numbers, loan sharking, extortion, vending machines. These guys had essentially a monopoly in certain areas of Staten Island in these sorts of uh, rackets. This was big business. One of the brothers of D'Alessio, Michael D'Alessio, was said to be a huge bookmaker, huge. And this is where Tommy Bellotti cuts his teeth. He begins running as an associate with the D'Alessios. And what the D'Alessios use him as is basically a pit bull enforcer. And that's one thing we learn about Thomas Bellotti. Thomas Bellotti was not only a bully, but very feared. Um, he would become very proficient in collecting loans uh, and other money for the D'Alessios, who, again, were very dialed in. By 1963, according to a Senate report on the mafia, both the Brizzy and all the uh, D- uh, D'Alessio brothers were discussed as made members in the mafia for the Gambino family. And DeBrizzi was a high-ranking guy. And at one point, D'Alessio had become a captain. So these guys are very dialed in in the back in the day Gambino crime family. For Tom Bellotti, he would be described at one point as a, quote, pit bull with shoes on. He stood 5'7 and was a rock solid 220. Now, as I said, Tommy Bellotti would be regarded as a bully. Not a lot of people really liked him. Um, he had no charm or sense of humor and had very little self-control. I'm going to talk about some of the disgusting and depraved ways Tommy Bellotti was able to collect. But here's the thing about being in the mafia. You don't have to be well-liked, okay? Tony Mira was incredibly not well-liked, but he got things done. He made a lot of money, and the family loved the envelopes he was kicking up. He didn't have to be well-liked. And the thing is about Tommy Bellotti, he wasn't well-liked. But for him, the come up in, in his career would be because one person liked him. And that guy was very pop, popular and powerful, which we'll get into. Now, not only was he a loan shark enforcer, but Tommy Bellotti also started to understand how loan sharking worked. And over the years, he would create an absolutely gigantic loan shark portfolio and book. For him, things are pretty good. Now, it was discussed. Now, we don't have these on paper. Tommy Bellotti was never brought to justice on these. But it is discussed by members of the FBI, most notably Joseph O'Brien, who we'll talk about, that Tommy Bellotti was thought to be involved in up to 10 murders for the Gambino family. Tommy Bellotti was very capable and very deadly. We'll get in, as I said, to some of the very sickening ways Bellotti would go to get money from people. Now, in 1969, Thomas Bellotti, seen here, would be arrested by NYPD for possession of stolen property. And we also would see him being arrested for other things like assault. Now, as I said, Bellotti was working essentially for John D'Alessio as an associate. And D'Alessio would call on him to do multiple things, including at one point in early 1971, D'Alessio began having problems with his daughter's boyfriend, a person called Tommy Ernst. Now, D'Alessio wanted him dead and at one point called upon not only Tom Bellotti, but his brother, Joey Bellotti. They would stalk, allegedly, Mr. Ernst to a diner in Grasmere, Staten Island and shoot at him. He would, though, survive. Now, D'Alessio would ultimately try to get to Ernst again at a summer home in the Poconos and would not be successful he would catch up eventually and have Mr. Ernst killed in the 70s. So Ernst survived a couple of times. But it is said we don't know who actually killed Ernst. It may have been Bilotti. We don't really know. Uh, but he had been suspected and possibly shooting at him at one point. Now, Bilotti, as I said, had two brothers, one of which was a person called Joseph Joey Bilotti. Now, Joey Bilotti would become a made member in the mafia in the early 80s under the tutelage of his brother, Tommy. Now, Tommy Bloody would have another brother, a brother called James. They called him Jimmy. Now, Jimmy was not associated, we know, with the mafia, but in the 70s and 80s, actually worked directly in the music business for Frank Sinatra. Now, we know Frank Sinatra had his connections to the mafia, so it is very possible. Here's what I'll say. 
I would probably characterize Jimmy Bellotti as probably a mob associate. He knew Frank Sinatra. He knew his two brothers who were in the mafia. It's possible he was involved in nefarious activities, but we don't exactly know. We like to bring you the details here on the sit down. So we don't always have the details, but we do know Jimmy Bellotti worked likely in some capacity for the mafia at one point. The good thing for Tommy Bellotti is life is all about connections. And we'll talk about his eventual meeting with Paul Castellano. Paul really liked Tommy. And Tommy, as we know, would become his driver. Now, Tom Bellotti would have one wife, a person called Catherine. She would, though, sadly, in her 30s, die of cancer. And he would then remarry to a woman in Brooklyn who owned a hair salon. Now, according to Sammy Gravano, Tommy Bellotti had 10 children, which is quite interesting. His brother, Joey, would have nine children. So the Bellottis had a lot of children and extended family. It was discussed that at one point, Tommy Bellotti did have, it was said, an autistic son who was severely autistic that was placed in institutional control that he would visit the kid quite regularly, but it was very rarely discussed. Now, eventually, Bellotti would catch the eye of Paul Castellano, who we have to understand by the early 70s and mid-70s was the underboss of the Gambino crime family under his cousin, Carlo Gambino. Bellotti would become the top aide to Castellano. He was a driver, he was an earner, and he was an indeed an enforcer. In 1977, in the month of October, Tom Bellotti would become a made member of the Gambino crime family. He would be subservient to Paul Castellano, would be in the early crew, though, of Jimmy Brown failure. We know that Jimmy Brown uh, was a very powerful individual, and we talked about him here. He was from Brooklyn, but lived in Staten Island, very close to Paul, very close to Tom Bellotti, very close to a lot of people. Now, eventually, Tom Bellotti would work directly and report directly to Paul Castellano. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Tom Bellotti's weird and annoying demeanor, because one thing we learn is as long as he's with Paul Castellano, according to Agent Joe O'Brien of the FBI, he has been featured in documentaries like Fear City. O'Brien would talk very openly about Tom Bellotti. He knew him well. He knew his kind of demeanor. He would say about Bellotti at one point in a book he wrote about Paul Castellano called Boss of All Bosses that, quote, Tommy was differential, subdued and watchful, yet calm like a dog on a rug when around Paul Castellano. His self-esteem derived from adoration of his master, and he could afford to be well-behaved. So around Castellano, he was very subservient. But O'Brien would say that problems would occur when Bellotti was sent on errands of his own and out of sight of his boss. He was bossy and rambunctious. He would try to play the big shot. He overdid things. He got creative in a sadistic sort of way and embroidered gratuitous cruelty through what should have been straightforward business transactions. And at one point, Bruce Mao would say that he cannot be trusted under any circumstance. Quote, don't ever talk to Tom Bellotti alone. He doesn't play by the rules and has a very short fuse. Now, I want to discuss some of Tom Bellotti's depraved ways to collect when it came to loan payments. At one point, O'Brien would talk about a vicious incident in a Staten Island bar where Bellotti went one afternoon to collect an interest payment. The bar owner had already been given a brutal beating several weeks earlier and was still recovering. Bellotti would walk in with a baseball bat. As several customers sat at the bar, they began to get up and move towards the exit. Bellotti would shout, stop, no one leaves, looking at the bartender who had now turned white. Now, this guy had owed Bellotti money. Bellotti would order him out from behind the bar and to get down on his knees in front of him. Bellotti would yell to the customers, quote, why do you assholes drink at a place run by a fucking scumbag who doesn't pay his bills? A fucking deadbeat. How can you do business with a fucking piece of shit like this? 
And he's a Fanuk besides, but he didn't say Fanuk. Fanuk is slang for a gay man, but he didn't say Fanuk and he didn't say gay. He said a word that ends in OT. He said, he's also that. You didn't know that? Now, Bilotti would continue to make his point, And as he did, he would pull down his pants zipper and order the bartender on his knees to put his mouth on him. You see, Bilotti told the customers he likes it. He would then kick the bartender in the chest, knocking him backwards, zipped his pants, and left. So again, what we learn about Bilotti is he's a good dog in front of his master, Paul Castellano. But when he's out playing around, he's a vicious pit bull and does what he has to do to collect and to create a reputation for himself. Tom Bilotti, again, would be a very capable individual under Castellano. He was earning... He did what he had to do. And in 1981, Bilotti would be elevated to a capo regime based out of Staten Island, very close to Paul Castellano's mansion in Tote Hill. In his crew would include his brother Joseph Bilotti, Giovanni John Gambino, John D'Alessio and his brothers, as well as a young associate named Joe Watts. Now, if we know know anything about Joe Watts, I've done a video on him as well. Joe Watts was an associate for years in the mafia. And most of us know him for being under John Gotti. But previous to the 85 hit on Castellano, Joe Watts was very subservient to Paul Castellano. And he came up under Tom Bellotti. We'll learn a little bit about what Joe Watts gets out of it in the end. So Tommy Bilotti's a captain. He's making a lot of money. He's very powerful. And he's essentially the number two. We know that when Paul is the new boss, we know that he had to make Neil Della Croce the underboss. But it was pretty much common knowledge. He wanted Tom Bilotti to be the underboss. Should Tom Bilotti have been the underboss? Of course not. Neil Della Croce was, surely should have been the underboss. Um, when Carlo went, Paul probably, though, in the back of his head, he knew he didn't want it, but he had to do it. It was just ha- something that had to happen. But it's likely he wanted Tommy underneath. Now, Tommy Bellotti, as I said, was making a lot of money in the loan sharking business, but he was also huge in other things as well. He would actually become vice president of a company called Scara Mix Concrete based on Staten Island. This was essentially a front company for the Gambino family. And Tom Bellotti was listed as vice president. However, you can't put him as president because he's a mafia member. So what does Paul do? He gets his squeaky clean son, Philip Castellano, and puts him in as president. Now, Castellano, the son, would say for years that his father had no connection to the company. But we would know through the involvement of Bellotti that they were very involved. And they were really big in city contract. They were making millions of dollars uh, supplying concrete uh, to various projects. Tommy Bellotti was also very connected with the local 638 steam fitters union uh, and various plumbers unions as well. It was also said that Bellotti maintained a nightclub on Staten Island. He was making big money. And what do we know about Castellano? He loves money. Bellotti's giving him a nice envelope every week. Very subservient. Everything worked perfect. Now, it was said at one point. Now, I learned this from the terrific YouTube channel of Anthony Ruggiano. I urge you to go check that out. Ruggiano, to me, is one of the most contrite people on YouTube. I really enjoy his content. Go check him out. He would say that at one point, he would know from, obviously, his connection to his father and that family that it was common knowledge that during the early 80s, Tom Bellotti and Joe the Cat Lafort ran Staten Island. It's that simple. If you wanted to run numbers, you wanted to get numbers, you wanted to put a bet in, you wanted to, you know, visit someone in prison. I just spit pretty bad there. Part of the game. Um, You had to go through these guys. So they were very powerful, very popular. Here we can see Jimmy Brown with our friend Paul Castellano. And um, on the left, that's Jimmy Brown in the middle is Tom Bellotti. We fast forward to 1985. Now, we are not going to go through this. We've all 
heard the assassination on Paul Castellano's story. But I do want to talk a little bit about what would happen to uh, Tom Bellotti. We would know that Bellotti was the driver of the car that night as it pulled up to Spark Steakhouse. And upon getting out, we know Castellano was shot multiple times. And so is Tom Bellotti. This is one of the most iconic photos of that evening. Here, Bellotti can be seen strewn out of the driver's side in front of a 17th precinct car. That night, it is alleged the shooters in the murder of Bellotti were Salvatore, Fat Salvatore Scala, as well as his brother-in-law, Eddie Lino. That was that for Tom Bellotti. At the time of his death, he was 45 years old. Now, the question I always have was, what would Bellotti have been if, let's say, someone else was driving him that night? We would probably venture to believe that he would have been killed in another way by someone else. But the smart people that were involved in this hit knew, if you have Paul, you're going to have Tommy. You take them both out. And it wasn't that Tom Bellotti did anything wrong. He was just on the wrong team. Everybody knew that. This was a method to get rid of Paul. And Tom was just collateral damage. And what did they do to the rest of the people con considered close to Tom Bellotti? They essentially said, are you with us now? People like Jim, Jimmy Brown. Jimmy Brown said, yeah. You know, Joe Piney, people like that. They're in. Now, the one individual that we can agree had a major problem with this was the brother of Tom Bellotti. Joseph Bellotti was a, a made man since the early 80s. and he, as we can understand, was furious. Now, after the murder, according to Sammy the Bull Gravano, Gravano would say that he had known Joey Bellotti, knew Tommy Bellotti. He went to see uh, Joey Bellotti because he was worried that Joey was going to do something crazy, which we can understand him for. According to Gravano, he would say, quote, Joe was obviously nervous. I told him that our move was primarily against Paul but given that his brother's reputation with Paul, he had to go too. Now, I would pull back my gun or pull back my jacket and show him a gun I was carrying. I told him, Joe, you know me a lot of years. If he wanted you dead, don't you think you'd be dead already? He looked at me and nodded his head. He would then say, Sammy, quote, Joe, I give you my word. We're going to give you a pass. I'm going to be your new captain. Don't worry when I send for you. You're a friend of ours in good standing. If you need me to sit down for you, I will. You've got a tough job. You have nine kids. Tommy had 10 kids. You have 18 kids to now take care of, 19 kids to take care of. And he's still alive today. And that's something Tommy would say, uh, uh, Sammy would say about Joe Bellotti. Now, Joe Bellotti, for the most part, would remain connected to the mafia into the 90s. In fact, would do prison time into the late 90s for extortion and other mob rackets. But after that, he would pretty much go off the grid. Um, Joey Bellotti would resurface in some community projects, including this one, which we could see in Gangland News. Um, he would be present at a Staten Island town hall meeting in an order to save a religious area um, involving the Catholic faith. Uh, Joe was also someone that donated a lot of money to local churches and the Staten Island community and pretty much lived out a pretty nondescript life. There was rumors he was representing the Gambinos at one point in some Florida business, but there's no real proof of that. Joe Bellotti would die in 2016, late 2016, at the age of 83. In the end, the lone book that Tommy Bellotti had would go to Joe Watts. The mafia is all about getting in line. If you are not a boss or underboss, even in a high level capo, you pretty much have to just play for what happens. And Joe Watts did that. He was not a made guy, but he was Lord to Paul and Tommy Bellotti. Then they were out of the way and Joe said, you know what? I'm good with this. Give me that loan book. And we know Joe Watts became a very rich individual as well and is still alive today. So Tommy Bellotti, a guy who, you know, we don't really kind of give the respect to. He's kind of a forgotten guy. He's just kind of that guy that was involved with the dying with Paul that night. But he was a lot more than just that. I appreciate you watching. As always, please hit that like button, subscribe.
We'll see you next week here on the 